Once again, happy Mother's Day to all our moms and all our grandmothers. And I just, just to be honest, I want everyone to know that, that Mother's Day is notoriously difficult and dangerous for pastors. I'm just going to tell you that right out of the gate. It is difficult and dangerous for us. And you say, why is it so difficult for a pastor? Why is it so hard? Let me just give you a couple of reasons. Number one, there's a lot of pressure because Mother's Day is one of like the biggest holidays on the church calendar. There's Easter, you know, there's Christmas, and there's Mother's Day. I mean, nobody cares about Father's Day. There's no pressure on Father's Day. I mean, in our culture, you've got basically President's Day, which is really good because you get deals on mattresses, Father's Day, and then Canadian Independence Day. Father's Day is more than, than the Canadian Independence Day just simply because nobody likes Canadians. And that's just about it. I mean, truthfully. But Mother's Day, it's a big deal. I mean, it is. It's Christmas, Easter, it's Mother's Day. These are the biggest days that are on the calendar. Second, for pastors, a problem usually is, is are you or are you not going to preach a Mother's Day sermon? You know, why is that a big deal? Well, it is a big deal because, number one, as a guy, I've never been a mom. So, how much wisdom am I bringing to the table, you know? I mean, there's really not a whole lot you can say, and it's almost like a guy writing a book on motherhood. I mean, it's like, consider the source. It's probably not the way you want to go. And then if you're going to preach on a sermon on Mother's Day, which topic are you, which passage are you going to pull? Which passage are you going to pull from? Are you going to dust off the ones that everybody does? Proverbs 31, 1 Samuel 1 with Hannah and Samuel. 2 Timothy 1 with Lois and Eunice and Timothy, those are good, but after that it starts getting a little thin. So it's really dangerous. I'm going to tell you, for pastors, if you mess up Mother's Day on Sunday, you may be looking for a job at Walmart on Monday. That's just the honest truth. So with that said, we're going to talk about Mother's Day this morning. I'm going to throw it all out the window, and we're just going to do it. And to make it even more spicier, we're going to take a passage that looks like it has nothing to do with Mother's Day, right? I mean, why not? You only live once. Walmart's a great place to work. It has benefits, you know? <laughs> so today we're going to look at John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. We're going to look at Jesus' first miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. And we're going to begin, we're going to look at and really talk about what it exactly means and what exactly is happening and why it fits in the gospel of John. But then after that, we're going to look at that and see something else. We're going to try to get a glimpse. We're going to try to get a glean of that special, unique relationship between Jesus and Mary. And from that relationship, we should be able to see a little bit of how godly moms relate to their kids. But even more than that, and probably more importantly, we're going to see how God relates to us. So as we begin, let's turn and look at our passage, and I will tell you that most of you are familiar with this passage. You're, you're familiar with this story. Do you know we're going to look at verses 1 through 12. We're going to look at this story as a whole. We're going to understand it as a group, so we're just going to mark through it. So as you know this story, you're familiar with this story. Uh, do know that, that this begins in verses 1 through 2. And we are told that Jesus and Mary and Jesus' disciples are all at the same wedding, attending this together in the area of Cana and Galilee. Do know that Cana and Galilee uh, uh, is a place that's pretty close to Jesus' hometown. So we don't really know exactly whose wedding it is. We don't exactly know what's going on. But we do believe that it's probably someone who is a part of the family or a good friend. Why do we think that? Well, number one, that Cana is probably less than 10 miles from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. It's local. Second, we do have the understanding that Mary and Jesus and his disciples are all invited to be there. And third, it does seem like that Mary has some involvement. She has some form of obligation when it all goes south and there's a problem at the wedding. It's like she needs to do something. Like it's, like it's in her area that she needs to be involved. Now, one thing we also need to understand very clearly, that weddings were a very big deal in this culture. It would involve your immediate family, your extended family. It would involve friends, and it also would really majorly involve the community. And not just the wedding, but the wedding feast. 
And the wedding feast could last pretty much up to seven days. And the burden of this wedding feast would fall on the groom and his family. And a big deal for the wedding feast is it had to have an abundance of supplies. It had to have food. It had to have drink. It had to keep on going. Everybody had to have as much as they want. To run out was a major social problem. It was something you didn't do. In this culture, hospitality is major. And you and I may think, well, that's just silly. Well, it may be to us, but it wasn't to them. And one thing we should never do is to read our culture into the Bible's culture. You need to understand it for what is happening and what's going on in it. And in this period, in this story, hospitality was major. Well, in verse 3, we see in the story that there is a problem. There's a major issue. The unthinkable has happened. They have ran out of wine at the wedding feast. This is a big deal. And now we see Mary goes into action. Now, we don't know if Mary was actually in charge of this. We don't know if she was helping behind the scenes. Or we don't know if she was just someone who understood this was a big deal. Either way, she gets moving. She gets active. And the way she gets active is looking at Jesus and says, you handle it. That's how she gets involved. Now, do know that at this point, we don't think she's telling Jesus to do a miracle. Because if you read later on in verse 11, it tells us that this is Jesus' first miracle. This is Jesus' first sign. We do believe at this time that Jesus is an adult, of course. He's already getting his disciples. He's beginning his ministry. We believe at this time that Joseph has already passed, Mary's husband. So Jesus has taken as that head of the household. He is the eldest child. He's the main provider. So basically, Mary is looking at Jesus as you would look somebody in that role, and she's just telling him, get involved, get it handled, get it done. And then we see Jesus' response in verse 4. Jesus' response in verse 4 brings a lot of confusion and a lot of question. Look at what he says in verse 4. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. First and most importantly, let me just say, don't do it. Because there's some of you out there thinking it's going to be okay to look at your mom or look at your wife and call her woman. And you're going to be able to say, because Jesus did it, it's okay. So let me answer that question now. Don't do it. It's not going to go well for you. I gave it a test drive this week. It did not go well for me. <laughs> Don't say woman, okay? Now, as we look at Jesus' response, we're going to look at this and go, man, that sounds a little rough. That sounds a little brusque. I mean, I can't believe Jesus is saying that. So let me just say this one more time. Do not read our culture into the text. It's not our culture. Because in Jesus' culture, this is not a sign of disrespect. This is not a lack of affection. Gune, gunai is actually more of a term of affection and a term of respect. In fact, when Jesus is on the cross in John chapter 19, verse 26, and he's making provisions for Mary, he looks at Mary, and he's talking about his disciple John. And he's saying, Mom, she's going to take, he's going to take care of you. And he does it by saying, Woman, behold your son. So this is not a term of disrespect. This is not a term that's a lack of affection. In fact, it has some affection and has respect in it. But with that said, do know this is not a response that we would expect. It's not the greatest term of endearment. It's not a response that you would expect from a mom and a son. It's polite. But what Jesus is doing, he's making polite distance between him and Mary. He then says after that, he says, what does your concern have to do with me? This is a Hebrew idiom, or, or it's a common saying at the time. What he is actually saying is, why are you getting me involved? Why do you want me to be a part of this? 
And then Jesus really throws a kink in. He says, my hour has not yet come. In the book of John, Jesus' hour refers to his death, burial, and resurrection. It refers to when he fulfills God's eternal plan to make a way for all people to be forgiven of their sin, rescued from their separation from God, and reconciled to him forever. It's referring to the time when his full glory is revealed in his resurrection and ascension. So what we really see in this is a polite rebuke. And what we have to understand is that Jesus is not answering Mary as a son. He's answering her as a savior. And honestly, this polite rebuke, it had to be hard for Mary to hear to a certain degree. I mean, this is a child that that she bore. This is a child that she nursed. This is a child that that she took care of. This is a child that she raised into a man. This is a child that she's leaning on right now to be the head of the household, to be the provider. It had to sting. But Jesus, as he begins his ministry, as Jesus is starting to fulfill what he came to do, What Jesus is saying is that nothing, not even my family, is going to take priority over my mission. You see, Jesus understood at this moment that Mary, just like every other person, was going to have to come to him in faith for forgiveness and rescue and reconciliation. What Jesus is doing here, he's politely putting a distance between him and Mary, and what he's saying is this. He's saying that when it comes to fulfilling God's plan, when it comes to identifying myself, as it comes to bringing glory to me, I am not gonna be distracted, and I'm not gonna be manipulated by anyone. What I do, I do for my glory, for my identity, for God's plan, for the fulfillment of the reason that I came. So what he's saying is, Mom, if I do this, if I get involved, it's going to be to reveal my glory and to fulfill God's plan, not because you've asked me and not because these wedding guests need it. Jesus is not answering as a son. He's answering as a savior. He knows exactly who he is. But in verse five, we see by Mary's response that she responds to her adult child just like every parent responds to their adult child. We have no idea how much she was getting of this. We really fully don't believe she understands all of this, but we know at this moment What she's really concerned is about the problem of the wedding and not really what her son had just said because her response in reflect is, okay, dear. And then she just looks at the servant and says, do whatever he says. So technically, she just blows right by it. But then we see in verses six through nine, Jesus decides to handle it. He decides to do a miracle really behind the scenes because the way he does it, only the servants and only his disciples are really seeing it. And the key thing is his disciples right now. So Jesus looks at the servants who are there, and he says, you see these six stone clay jars? Uh, These jars handled about 20 to 30 gallons of water. They were used for ceremonial cleaning, ceremonial washing. He says, go take those, and I want you to fill them to the top with water, and they did. And then Jesus says, I want you to take a little bit out, and I want you to take it to the ruler of the feast, or take it uh, to the master of the feast, or take it to the head waiter, whatever your translation says. And, And basically what this guy was, his job was to make sure everything at the wedding feast went smoothly, that everybody got what they needed. And so when they deliver to him, the head waiter, the ruler, the master of the feast calls over the bridegroom, and in verse 10, he says this. Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. The miracle of water to wine. 
Now, the question that we have here is, why did Jesus do this? Why did he perform this miracle? And what's amazing is we don't have to guess because we are told in verse 11, very clearly, Jesus did this to reveal his glory. Jesus did this to reveal his identity. Jesus did this to be able to prove that he is God the Son who has come to give his life as a ransom for many. He did this so his disciples would believe and understand that he did this, what no one else can do, and therefore he can do everything else he says that he can do. He can forgive sin and take our place on the cross and die for us. It was just to declare his identity for his glory. And it's that simple. It really is that simple. I often become amazed at how complicated we make Scripture. How difficult we just seem to make it. You know, there's really two major principles about God's Word. It's about Scripture. Number one, it's God's Word, and it's authoritative. And number two, it was written to be understood. It was written to be understood. What I find amazing is that for some reason we feel like we need flip charts and night goggles and a slide rule to understand what it's saying. Most of the time, all you need to do is take it for what it says. In looking at this passage, what I find amazing is, is how so many people say and believe that this is all about allegory or this is about metaphors, but everything is symbolic of everything else. They would say this, that because the wine ran out, it shows the sufficiency or the insufficiency of the Jewish law uh, and that it doesn't meet the needs of the people. That the six jars, the fact that Jesus filled them to the brim, shows that he has abundance and unlimited grace. Or that the fact that Jesus gave the choice wine at the end, it just proves that he's better than the Jewish law. And to that, I just say, no. 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 I love the way that theologian Robert Mounts, an all-around smart guy, he, he said this. While these allegorical reflections are homiletically entertaining, they do not lie at the heart of what was intended by identifying the miracle as a sign. What the miracle pointed to was the divine nature of Jesus, not a series of comparisons between Jewish law and the gospel. So what is he saying? He's saying that verse 11 tells us why he did it. To reveal his glory. That the disciples would believe. And know that he is who he says that he is. So that is what the passage is about. That is what the passage says. And that is why it's in the gospel of John. Now with that said... We can look at this passage, I believe, and see a little interesting nuance, and that is the relationship, the unique relationship between Mary and Jesus. And I do think as we look at this unique relationship, this nuance between them, we can actually see how godly moms can relate to their kids, and we can also very much see how God relates to us. So I'll tell you, the first thing that we kind of look at and grab from this passage is that godly moms are to be connected. Godly moms are to be connected. They need to be involved in their kid's life, no matter how old they are or how far they move away. When we look at this passage, we do see that Mary is connected in Jesus' life. Up to his ministry, there seems a very strong level of connection and involvement. She raised him his whole life. There appears that Jesus loves her and she loves him. He is the one who's actually being the head of the household up to this point. He is the one who's the main breadwinner at this point in the household. Now, after his ministry begins, there is a polite separation. There is a distance. But we also see that Mary tries to intervene. This is not good. It was not right. But she still tries to be involved. We also see that Mary is there at the cross when Jesus dies. And we have strong views and beliefs from the book of Luke that Mary was actually a believer of Jesus after the resurrection. What we can see is that Mary stayed involved. She stayed connected in Jesus' life. And godly moms do the same thing. 
Godly moms stay connected. They stay involved in their child's life no matter how old they get. Now, I am not saying that godly moms are controlling and manipulative and try to control their adult child's life. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that a godly mom will keep communication. That a godly mom will continue to influence. That a godly mom will keep that relationship. That a godly mom will continue to build bridges that allows the child, no matter the age, to come back for advice, for leadership. Comedian George Burns said this, He said, happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family that lives in another city. (laughs) Maybe true. No comment. All I will say is this. All the research points to a different understanding of moms. Now, we know that adult children, when they're connected to their moms, are usually have a little more joy, a little more encouraging attitude. They also have a little more understanding in life. We understand that moms have one of the greatest impacts on their kids, no matter their age. And that's why it's good for godly moms to continue to be involved in their child's life, pushing them to Christ. But just as it is important to have your mom involved in your life or for you to be involved in your child's life, it's more important to be connected and involved with God. God desires to be connected to us. God wants to be involved in our life. He wants to lead. He wants to guide. He wants to show us his amazing love. He wants us to be able to know him, to walk with him, to serve him, to have a close communication that comes from daily Bible study and prayer. He wants us to feel his love that comes in a daily fellowship with him. He wants us to join him in the work that he's doing and to know his power in a practical way. God wants to be involved and connected with us even more than our moms do. In Psalm chapter 9, we read in verses 9 through 10, the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. God wants to be involved. He wants to be connected. And if we seek him, he will be found. And he will be involved. Godly moms cannot be replaced. Their impact cannot be replaced in our lives. And just as important as a godly mom is, what we truly need is to be connected and involved with Christ on a daily level, no matter who we are. The next thing we can glean or maybe glimpse from this passage as we see Mary and Jesus' relationship is that godly moms should be supportive. Godly moms should be supportive. They should support and know their child's potential, pushing them to Christ, to serve him. What's interesting in this passage is that we see that as soon as there is a problem, as we know that there is an issue at hand, Mary's first response is to look at Jesus and say, handle it. Get in there, get involved. She wouldn't have said that if she didn't trust him. She wouldn't have said that if she didn't know that he had ability, he had talent. Yes, he is God the Son, I get that. But at this point, we're pretty much understanding he hadn't performed any miracles. He hadn't done anything. He had shown this in the daily way that he lived his life. He had shown leadership. He had shown potential. And obviously, Mary saw it. She didn't know how he was going to handle it. But she knew he would. She was supportive. She saw something in him. And godly moms are like that, aren't they? They support us. They see things in us that we don't necessarily see ourselves. And they're always pushing us to know Christ, to know who we are in Christ, and grab a hold of our identity in Christ. In the mid-70s, there was this uh, Christian recording artist by the name of Wendell Burton. He was not really popular outside of Christian music, but inside Christian music in the 70s, he was pretty popular. Songwriter, musician. Well, 
his mom wanted him to be popular with everybody. She thought he was immensely gifted. And so she contacted one of her friends who was the aunt of Bob Dylan. If you do not know Bob Dylan because you're too young, Google him later. Um, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2016. You should be able to find him. For the rest of us, you know who he is. He's a pretty big, uh, legendary music figure. Well, Mom got in contact with Bob Dylan by actually showing up at his house. And she gave Bob Dylan her son's albums, records, and said, listen to these and tell me what you think. When Wendell Burton heard this, he was mortified, right? Our response, always. Mom, why did you do this? Mom, don't ever do that. Bob Dylan doesn't care about my music. And his mom's response was, of course he does. You're talented. Why wouldn't he care about your music? A couple weeks later, Wendell Burton got a phone call from Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan called Wendell and said, listen, your mom came by. I've listened to your stuff. It's pretty good. Why don't you come over? i got some stuff going on. I'd love to have your input. Not really sure what impact it had after that, but I love Wendell Burton's final comment. He said, only a mom would think I'm as talented as Bob Dylan. But isn't that the way moms think, though? Don't moms see things in us that no one else does? And isn't that what godly moms do? Godly moms push their kids to see themselves through Jesus Christ's eyes, to know that we are created by him, changed by him, that he has a plan for us, to know that we should have God-sized dreams because we serve a big God, to know that we should have the idea of growing faith, knowing that Christ can do anything in our lives that he calls us to. Moms always see that potential in us. and They're always supportive. But truly, there are no comparison to God. Because God only truly knows mine and your potential. He only knows what you and I are capable of, the only one. Because he's the only one who created us. He's the one who designed us. He's the one who knows our purpose and our abilities and our gifts. Listen to what it says in this famous a passage in Psalm 139, verses 13 through 14. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. God has made us. God has designed us. And what he has designed us and made us to do is to love him, to know him, and to serve him. And when we focus on knowing him and loving him and serve him, he moves us to serve him in amazing, special ways, ways that only you and I can do. Why? Because that's what he designed us to do. That's what he created us to do. He's designed us to serve and glorify him in a special way that he made us for. Moms are amazing. They see things in us that we don't. They support they love, they encourage. But what we really need to grab a hold on and embrace is that our God designed us and made us. And in his hands, we can truly be what he made us to be. The third thing that we can see from this unique relationship between Jesus and Mary that really can be applied to our godly moms today, is that sometimes godly moms need to be hands-off. Godly moms need to be hands-off. It's at this point that the mothers went, mm, I don't know about that. Godly moms need to be hands-off. There are times they need to allow their children to make decisions, to make decisions on their own. That doesn't mean that you like the decision. It doesn't mean you agree with the decision. It doesn't mean you think it's a smart decision. But what you understand, there comes a time when your child must be responsible for their decisions. We kind of see this between Mary and Jesus. At the time when we had the problem at the wedding feast, Jesus, Mary springs into action, and she goes, and she tells Jesus, do something, be involved, handle this. And then she looks at the servants and say, do whatever she said. Do whatever he tells you. Mary does not micromanage. Mary does not nag. Mary does not become overbearing. 
Mary does not manipulate, backs off, and Jesus handles it in his way. And see, sometimes as godly moms, you got to understand that the best solution is not to be controlling or suggestive or manipulating or whatever you want to call it. Sometimes the best thing is to have hands off. Not that you agree with the decision. Not that you think the decision is the best way to go. Not that you don't love him. But honestly, it's because you do love him. I was watching the news last week and I learned something that's a growing trend that I did not know was happening. But in the business world today, millennials, as they're going to apply for jobs and go to interviews, they're taking one of their parents to help with the negotiations. And to make this even worse, in my opinion, some companies are preparing what's called parent packs. So if the parent is not there, they can put the information in a pack, maybe pin it to their chest, I don't know, but they pin it to a pack and send it home with the kid, excuse me, the adult child, so that they can talk to their parents about it. And to that, once again, I just say no. No. I mean, there's got to be a time when the adult child becomes the adult. There's got to be time when we actually allow our kids to make decisions and bear the responsibilities. Not because they're right, not because you don't love them anymore, not because you agree, because there comes a time when they need to be responsible. And Christian, do you understand that God does that with us? See, God loves us. And God calls to us. He says, obey my will, obey my word, follow me, focus on me in your life. But Christian, you and I both know God will allow us to make decisions even if it's out of his will. And you want to know why God allows us to make decisions that are out of his will? So that we'll know we don't need to make decisions out of his will. He allows us to do it because it's going to fail. It's going to break apart. It's going to blow up. It helps us understand that we don't want to live outside of him. We don't want to live outside of his ways, his will, his word. He allows us to make these decisions so that we understand all I want to be is in your presence. I love Exodus 33. In Exodus 33, God looks at Israel and he tells Moses, I'm not going with you people anymore. You have sinned, you've rebelled, you've turned your back on me. I'm going to send you into the promised land uh, with, with a supervisor, but I'm not going with you. If I stay with you, I'm going to wipe you off the face of the earth. I can't take this level of unholiness. And I love Moses' response in Exodus 33, verses 15 through 16. He says this, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except that you go with us? See, this is what Moses is saying. Moses is saying is, God, if you're not going with us, I don't want to go. I don't want to be anywhere that you're not. And listen, this is why God allows us to make decisions out of his will. But godly mom, this is why you need to let your kid make some really bad decisions. Because they need to learn that they don't need to rely on you for the rest of their life, and they don't need to rely on their wisdom for the rest of their life, but they need to learn that they need to rely on Christ. They need to learn that they can't breathe outside of his presence. So godly mom... You take your hands off from time to time, not because you don't love them, because you do love them, and you want them to know that life doesn't work unless they're living in God's will, in God's way, in God's word. Take your hands off because you love them. So as we've looked at John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and understand what it means in the gospel of John, and then we've kind of gleaned a little nuance, a nuance of, uh, of this relationship between Jesus and Mary, and, and tried to, to kind of piece together how godly moms can, can, can interact with their kids and how God reacts to us and, and works in our lives. The question is, how should we respond to all this, or, or what, what should we do with this today? 
And I will tell you, I think that the best way to respond to this is just, just to praise God for godly moms. Just to praise God for godly moms, to praise God for their impact, their influence, and what they do. So what does this mean to you? Well, first I want to talk to moms. I want to say this respectfully, because I don't want to be working at Walmart tomorrow. It's a great place, but I'm really not ready to go there right now. Say this respectfully. Moms, no one can replace you. No one can replace you. In your child's life, it does not matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how old they are. It doesn't matter what position of life is. You still have one of the greatest influences in your child's life. You impact them. You are irreplaceable. But know this, your primary job is to point them to Jesus Christ. That's your job. No one impacts like you. To lead, to guide, to influence, to call, to show, to model. You're to point them to Christ. Because I'm going to tell you, what your child needs is not a better job. And what your child needs is really not a better education. And what your child really doesn't need is to be socially, you know, well-adjusted, whatever that means. Those are important. But I tell you, the main thing your child needs is an active, growing, focused love of Jesus Christ. And everything else will fall into place. That's your main job. So mom, as we do honor you and thank you for all that you are and all that you do, as we enter the invitation this morning, mom, I'm gonna encourage you just to pray. Just a few moments, we're going to have an invitation. Invitation is a time for you to do what the Holy Spirit is leading you. And mom, I'm just going to encourage you to pray. And say, what do I need to do to continue to influence, direct, and lead my child to Christ? If you need help during that as you're praying, the altar is open. There will be three guys down here who will be willing to pray with you. But you may want to pray with another mom beside you. That may be more effective. Either way. Seek him. Now, mom, this morning you may not be a Christian. You may not be a believer. And let me just tell you flat out, you can't direct your child to someone you don't know. And that's why I believe that the Holy Spirit is talking to you and to every person here who does not know Christ as their Savior. The Holy Spirit is making very clear to you that you're separated from God because of your sin. You do not have a relationship with him. But he's inviting you to come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. And this morning, the Holy Spirit is making sure that you know enough to respond to that. During the invitation, you'll be standing, you'll be singing. As the Holy Spirit is making that clear to you, I invite you to step out and come down and talk to us three guys down here. We can tell you about Jesus. We love to tell you about Jesus and how he'll change your life like he changed ours. This morning, for the rest of us Christians, I'll encourage you. I'll encourage you to spend some time and praise God for a godly mom in your life. Listen, if your mom is still around, if you can, your mom or your grandmother, you need to call her and thank her and probably say, I'm sorry for a lot of things. You don't have to mention them. She knows. But if you're like me and you don't have your mom, especially spend time praising God for what she did for you. But Christian, I do want to say one more thing, and I want to make this really important because this is something that we really can understand from this passage. Is that Jesus did distance himself from Mary in a polite way, in a loving way. He loved her, we can tell. But the Father's will came first. And Christian, nothing can never be first in your life but Jesus. So as you're praying today and thanking God for your mom, also lay out there and say, Jesus, you're first. The mission's more important. Nothing comes second. Tell me what I'm to do for your glory. As you pray through that, the altar's open. We're available. You can pray with those beside you. No matter who you are today, thank God for your mom and listen to the Holy Spirit and do whatever he tells you to do.
Lord, we pray.